Thank you for coming to this event um, today on um, a Sunday this close to Christmas. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, and I am going to um, speak through the mic and ask everyone, even if you have questions, I know it's a small group, but to also speak through the mic um, today only because we will be um, recording this talk. Um, anyway, thank you everyone for coming um, to this um, panel discussion on the occasion of uh, Frank's uh, solo exhibition uh, in Gallery 2 that's right behind them. Um, we decided to seat them right in front of it so you could also see and hear it throughout the entire discussion. Um, anyway, we're really grateful for Frank's exhibition and also for all of the panelists to be here today um, to be in discussion. Um, about it. Um, so just really quick, um, a little bit about Smack Mellon before we start. Uh, my name is Rachel Vera Steinberg. I'm the curator and director of exhibitions at Smack Mellon. Um, Smack Mellon is an organization that has been around since 1995, always in Dumbo. Um, and our mission is to support um, emerging underrepresented mid-career and women artists in the production of ambitious work. Um, which we do through our three main programs. Um, the first one is our studio residency program, um, which is kind of below us, um, where we give six studios to, um, to uh, emerging artists for a full year to make their work. Um, we also have an education program um, where we work with public high school students um, and mentor them for the entire year, which culminates in an exhibition in our space. And then our most visible program is the exhibitions program, which we are here to talk about today. Um, often um, when we're working with artists, um, we work to produce their most ambitious exhibition to date, um, or at least their first solo exhibition in New York City, um, either one. Um, and, you know, we also are really interested in artists who are working with very, like, politically and socially relevant topics, um, and also making experimental work that's not necessarily saleable, <laughs> um, you know, which can go in many different ways. Anyway, um, so, uh, I'm just going to grab my notes really quick. Um, so, Back to Frank's exhibition. Um, it was really a pleasure to work with Frank on this exhibition. Um, he actually submitted a proposal to our open call, um, which I was so excited about when I saw it. Um, and this exhibition, um, which he comes from a body of work that he created in 2020, um, kind of the summer of 2020, after being stuck in um, Berlin for an extended um, lockdown period, a little unexpectedly. And um, for me, this was one of... Um, you know, it was a rare instance of artwork that had been made during the peak of pandemic that really captured this feeling of time that we were all experiencing on a massive scale um, and not in a way that was, you know, extremely over the top, but really, really understood the in-betweenness of the moment that we were living through. And so I was really impressed by this exhibition um, that he then kind of redesigned in order to um, suit this space. Um, so it was really great to work with him. Um, anyway, I am also really happy to welcome all the panelists today um, to be here in person to discuss the work. Um, so first we have um, Natasha Chuk, um, who is a New York City-based media theorist, writer, and educator, um, whose work is situated at the intersection of art, philosophy, and creative technologies. Um, she's the author, author of numerous texts, including her book, Vanishing Points, Articulations of Death, Fragmentation, and uh, the Unexperienced Experience of Created Objects. It's a great title for a book, too. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Um, Chan Fan Gu is an art critic, writer, and translator who has received numerous awards and written many international, written for many international publications. She's the co-founder of Hai Chi Magazine and has served as co-founding publisher of Gong Press since 2018. Thank you also for being here. Um, and finally, um, this discussion will be moderated by Barbara Pollock. Barbara is a curator, educator, and writer, and a veteran of the global contemporary art world. She is the co-founder of Art at a Time Like This, a nonprofit organization providing a platform for free, uh, free 
excuse me, free expression to artists addressing pressing issues of the 21st century. Um, so we don't have time to list all of her accolades now, um, as much to say that she is a very widely published um, and a, a leading expert on Chinese contemporary art. And we're grateful to have her here leading this discussion. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and without any further delay, I will turn it over to you, Barbara, um, to start um, the conversation. Great. Thank you, everybody, for being here. And thank you to the panelists and to Frank for pulling us all together. Um, before we begin, I just wanted to share with you that there's been an issue with Chinese contemporary art for the last few decades about where it belongs. Um, and I went back and looked at Ho Han Ru's classic book, On the Middle Ground. Um, where he proposed that what Chinese artists in the diaspora represent is a kind of hybridity and the embodiment of multiculturalism. Frank uses the term in-betweenness. Um, and in some ways, one of the questions I'm going to pose to him and others is, you know, what's the difference between what the way, the situation in the 90s and the situation now and does that empower artists in a different way but i think it's a question that i want people to bear in mind while we have this discussion about um you know is this asian american art is this immigrant art is this a continuation of what's going on in beijing and shanghai where does it where does it lie and what kind of hopes it brings to us in terms of global communication but first, before we get too theoretical or anything, I wanted Frank to just walk us through a second the exhibition and talk about the elements in the installation. Sure. Uh, thanks, Barbara. And thanks, everyone, for being here on a Sunday. Uh, I really appreciate it. First, uh, before we dive in, uh, I just want to express my uh, gratitude to Smack Mellon, to uh, Rachel, the curator, uh, Caitlin, the um, uh, executive director, and also Javier and Dorian for making this show happen. Um, you know, I had pure joy putting this together, and also our great panelists, you know, the panel, um, because I really consider this is my first uh, important uh, solo exhibition in an institution in New York City, so uh, I really appreciate all your support and having this conversation together with me today. Um, so, in short, uh, this project is indeed uh, conceived and uh, created in 2020. That year, I was actually having my sabbatical, and uh, I went to Berlin for a short residency, uh, but eventually it became become like a seven months strand in Berlin, uh, unexpected. Um, so, uh, you know, you have like a strong sense of displacement, of course, and a lot of absurdity, you know. Uh, my experience was, my context was actually especially uh, uh, uncanny because uh, I remember the first night when Mokel, um declared national emergency. Uh, I lived in Questburg in Berlin at the time, you know, and I remember very clearly everyone was actually celebrating, dancing and singing and playing guitar and drinking in the street. <laughs> I'm like, you know, that's very interesting. I guess the, the idea of apocalypse is deeply embedded in these European people's uh, DNA, you know. <laughs> Uh, but very quickly, the second day became depression, right? And uh, I, was, um, I got stuck in the same studio, uh, live workspace, uh, in the same house for seven months. And um, that was the moment I actually, uh, but, but I, I feel like at a moment, maybe I started really looking at it as an event, uh, an important opportunity for us to reassess our values and uh, the so-called normality. And that was the moment I started, you know, uh, paying attention to these objects around me. Uh, that were stranded together with me, you know, these finite objects, right? Uh, and uh, I turned them into uh, these characters that are repeatedly inflated and deflated. Um, so as a way to kind of, you know, looking at our world uh, other widely. So that's kind of like the mindset behind it. Yeah, and I'm sure we can talk up more about, you know, uh, these channels. Um, yeah. And can I just ask you about the fabrics hanging down? Yeah. Are there messages on them or...? Yeah, so writing was actually also an important part of it. Um, as uh, you know, I'm sure maybe Chen Fan or the, you know, uh, Natasha and uh, um, yeah, Barbara will talk more about it too. Because uh, all these characters well, slash objects, I started writing poems for them. 
Uh, but the funny thing was I was writing in English, you know, so naturally I'm not a na native English speaker. So naturally there is a distance between the things I'm writing um, and, uh, you know, uh, what I'm trying to express. Uh, and then the class was a decision we made specifically for the, for, for the installation of this space, you know, trying to re recontextualize the work uh, to fit this space. Uh, and they're actually uh, made in a VR system, so I was sculpting VR. I came from a sculptural background. Um, so, you know, if you think about it, they also carry this ambivalent identity. They're both 2D and 3D. They're both tangible and, uh, you know, virtual. If you want to output them, they can become a sculpture. Uh, so that is the reason why they're made kind of hard to read on purpose. Yeah. Um, it's fascinating to me that this came out of uh, experiencing the pandemic and the lockdown and that you anthropomorphize the objects in your apartment around that. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask the two other panelists, um, starting with Natasha, whether you've seen the way the, ha, it has work already appeared that uh, was influenced by the lockdown and living through the pandemic. Do you see that in your field? Do I see that in this work without knowing that in advance? Is that, is that the no, question? No, but also, are you seeing that as a broader thing that's happening? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, a little bit. I mean, I think, I think the, the way the, the pandemic kind of marked us, right? Um, we were all online before the pandemic, but suddenly we were like left to our own devices, literally um, networking with everyone remotely. And looking at our spaces differently, I think, um, you know, suddenly we didn't have the choice to leave. And so, yeah, I think, I think there is this kind of reflection of, you know, making work that deals with the moment. Um, and, and that's precisely what's going on in this, in this piece. And Chin Fan, um, I also found that it was like an incredible moment for global communication through screens. Um, I saw an impact of this on Chinese artists. Have you seen that? Um, for me, I feel it's maybe a little bit too early to summarize there is a certain shift. Because I still personally feel I'm, I'm, I'm still in the process, in the transition. But I, but I feel that I want to borrow this term I found in one of your texts. Um, that's the press release for your previous show at Vanguard. It's called diachronic um, poeticality. Like the diachronic um, aspect highlights that you kind of need to experience it together with the changes, with the unknown things, with the things that you are still trying to figure out. And I think Frank is trying to find the poeticality within that experience. Um, and that's maybe something is shaping to be a transit and form. Oh, that's very, you know, that's interesting to me. I hadn't thought of it that way. Um, and so with this in, in installation, I think of, yes, a becomingness. Frank calls it in-betweenness. Um, and a feeling of space that's evolving, that gets evoked by the the thing like the cigarette pack enlarging and contracting and the ch egg, the chocolate egg. Right. Uh, Kinder. What? Kinder chocolate. Kinder chocolate, right. <laughs> Expanding and contracting and this feeling of space that's not fixed. Mm. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Um, yeah, sure. I guess I can talk a little bit more about this idea of in between is which I actually, uh, in fact, wrote an essay for H Magazine, like in that year. Um, well, first of all, that's obviously you know um, um, influenced by my transnational uh, experience, uh, and um, you know, but it was especially in the pandemic. Well, this work is you know heavily inspired by the pandemic but it didn't stop right there you know uh, the experience actually made me think about my uh, existential condition in the world which actually um, how one is uh, transforming from an immigrant to a nomad and uh, this in between is with it it comes with the idea of like you are always suspended uh, in between different ideologies different politics different history 
uh, personal narratives and geog geographical locations. So, um, you know, um, then you, 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 feel a, you feel a strong sense of groundlessness, right? So the idea of groundlessness is always at work. Um, but then the question for me, when we were stuck in that moment, it became how do you, in that atmosphere, find your identity formation and try to find some new imagination and new connectivities with different things, people, and uh, places. Um, and that was a moment, I guess that's also a part of the reason why I turned my attention to these uh, objects instead of people, because <laughs> you don't see, you didn't see a lot of people anyways, you know. Um, yeah, am I answering the question? Quite well. <laughs> okay. is that's um, extremely interesting for an artist to adopt as their identity. Like even when I write, every artist you write about, you say Chinese artist or German artist is how you introduce them to the audience. And the idea that there's a whole new identity that's not attached to mm -hmm. um, a particular geography mm -hmm. um, is pretty interesting to me. What, you're nodding your head, Natasha. Yeah, no, I, yeah I'm nodding. Um, I, I, I think that was a really great answer. Um, I was thinking about the even the, the digital nomad as, as how you, you've been talking about it too. Um, all things, all conditions that were in place before the pandemic but were exacerbated by it. Like we started to think about them a little bit differently. Um, and this idea of like the internet being sort of placeless in its own way, you can tap into it any time of day. There's always someone around. Um, so there's there are already these conditions for that to happen. And so it's a, it's a place where you can play and you can invent already. And I feel like a lot of what you're doing with this work kind of brings that world out for us. It like materializes some of those connections or some of those um, imaginary kind of formations um, and, and makes them tangible for us to experience. So yeah. Han, what do you think? Or should yeah, I ask more? <laughs> I mean, on this issue of um, whether artists today who are not based in one location are the difference between being an immigrant and a nomad, I find that a very fascinating thing to think about. Yeah, um, I have to highly recommend people, everyone here, to read Frank's writing for H Magazine, <laughs> the In Between Condition, right? It's yeah, called. The In Betweeners Condition. Right, the In Betweeners Condition, um, where he discusses more in depth, and he also brings in a lot of other philosophers' ideas um, to come up and like conclude them as in between us. Um, I remember one thing that you mentioned, like it's um, from the geographist um, Duan Yifu, yeah. right? So he says that a place and a space is different because a place is more about the security you get, but then a space is more about the freedom you get from the space, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I agree. Could, um, Talk about the term in between us a little bit more because um, you're experiencing it as being boundless yeah. and a kind of freedom that comes from not being confined. Is that true? Yeah, I feel like it's actually, um, um, can I even call that a cartograph? You know, maybe it's more like an atmosphere, as Chen Fan mentioned, you know, the difference uh, Yifu Tuan actually uh, talked about in his book uh, about. Well, that was also a strong moment. I realized that you know, I stopped wherever I go to travel. I stopped looking at this location as a place, as a ge geographical location, but a space of possibility. Uh, and um, uh, we probably have a lot of travelers in the audience, and you travel, and maybe you are here first as an Im uh, uh, immigrant or an international student. I don't know, but uh, I was. Uh, and um, when I first got here, you constantly heard the comment that, you know, okay, Frank, so now you are a bridge between the East and West. And then uh, more and more, I just realized that comment is radically wrong, you know, because uh, it's not a bridge. Uh, you know, when you are in a bridge, the, 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 the gesture of the traveling is from point A and point B, right? It's linear. And uh, the idea of entering it is trying to exit it as soon as possible. Uh, but I feel like the atmosphere of in between is is a place that's just your you know uh, and reality, um, where you find your world building. 
uh, and it goes to all possible directions. You know, so that's that that, that that's why I think uh, um, it's important to think about connectivity. You know, uh, not with just uh, uh, the place, but also everything. You know, things, um, even the cosmos, maybe. <laughs> you, you just said this is very interesting to me. You just said that when you first came here, you were your identity was as an immigrant. Is that's, I, that was a uh, objective reality, right? I mean, I was first as a uh, international student with an F1 visa. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, do you feel that your identity has shifted from that? Um, it's very personally. Sub it's very subjective, you know, and a lot of it is actually affective. Uh, so, for example, I don't know how you guys feel, but maybe Chen Fan can talk about it too. Like nowadays. Um, I, uh, if I go back to China, it really feels like I'm, I'm, I'm doing a business trip, right? Or maybe traveling uh, for leisure purposes, sightseeing. Although all my uh, families are still in China, but you don't really feel like going back home, you know? So this sense of uh, a groundlessness is always uh, there. And uh, I'll probably never feel that. Uh, I'll probably stay a, you know, uh, a stranger in America. Um, which is very interesting to me, you know? And um, um, as Rachel mentioned, I actually quit my job to move to New York City this February. But then the funny thing is, since this February, I haven't been staying in New York City that much. And again, I was traveling a lot. Uh, but then I deeply understand that such kind of traveling and this kind of nomadism, uh, there is a privilege to it, right? I was able to do these traveling, you know? So um, uh, what you can, how do you do your best uh, to imagine things to maybe to make meaningful works works during this process becomes a task. Um, yeah, I think. So, um, I want to ask both of you, what when you hear these terms, when you hear Frank discuss these terms, have you seen this in other artists? Do you see this as a trend, or what does it make you think about? Do you want to start, Chin Fan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you see it? How do you see him fitting in with other artists' work right now? Um, I feel maybe every artist has their own term or saying to describe this kind of in betweenness thing. Um, Frank puts it in this way, that is related to the migration and nomadism and all those. Um, other artists may put like in other phrases and expressions, but I feel it's a shared and collective experience that we are all um, experiencing right now. Um, isn't the new, like the, um, when is my now, the, the, the topic will be everyone is a foreigner? What? Something like everyone is a foreigner. So I feel the foreignness not only to a place that is truly a foreign country, but also maybe to your own country, um, is the sense that we are all experiencing right now. Right. Um, I want to speak to this question um, through a, a slightly different lens and, and think about the in-betweeners condition in a, in a slightly different way. Um, because I see this work functioning on the level of um, kind of national identity, language, you know, lots of different ways in which we identify home or a sense of belonging or, you know, just a residence. And it's interesting that you went to Berlin for a residency. I mean, the word itself sort of suggests that you're putting some roots down at least for three months or however long your stay is. Um, and that you will get something out of that experience. That's the whole purpose of a residency. And so we have different ways in which kind of this in-betweeners condition um, has been like sanctioned, if you will, or you know, we have systems in place to make it possible um, and, and to take advantage of it. But I also wanna think about it in terms of the work itself and how it sort of refuses to be one thing 
Um, it's an installation, but it's really complex. It has, you know, video components. There's VR that was involved. You know, it's sculpture in this, like, really unique way. And so it, it won't settle for this kind of easy definition or an easy understanding of what it's doing. So I, I see that as part of the condition of being an in-betweener, um, not kind of fixing yourself on one way of making work or even identifying with a particular method or material. Um, so yeah, I think the duality of this installation in terms of its material components and kind of immaterial digital components are really interesting in that way that they're kind of like putting form to this idea of the in-betweener condition, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that both of your answers were really helpful at least to me, because this is an issue I'm really thinking about. But also, uh, a number of artists, instead of using the term in between, talk about misunderstandings, misinterpretation. Is that an aspect in your work? Or do you, any of you see it as an aspect in the work? Frank, do you want to start? Um, I. Maybe sometimes I think it, it depends on how you look at it, but maybe misunderstanding isn't a bad thing. You know, if you uh, enter it through the angle of imagination, you know, like for me, I definitely hope my work is uh, open-ended, more open-ended, so it um, leaves the viewer to find their conclusions. You know, I'm, I made the text really hard to read, <laughs> right, on purpose. Um, yeah, I mean. Yeah, I was drawn to that too, the text is, if you haven't looked yet, uh, the text is kind of difficult to read. There's a term called ergodic literature, um, which is used to talk about, like, I don't know, the way that the internet, I mean, it's, it's an ancient form, but it's basically non-trivial effort is required to read it. And I think about just kind of like this method of um, making text that's hard to read um, when it's, it's a language that you should be able to understand if you know the words. But anyway, so it's like an interesting way of thinking about the in-betweenness of understanding in mm -hmm. general. Yeah. Um, I just feel like um, the misinterpretation and then the misunderstood works are the best because like if you feel like um, something agreeable to your own opinions, then like there's nothing new to be added. Mm -hmm. um, so every time you feel like stimulated or like pissed off even, maybe that's a good sign. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do you, do you think, I, I'm trying to uh, process this question better. So uh, are, are you thinking about misunderstanding maybe uh, its interplay with the idea of representation? Um, yeah, like how you're represented or... Um. Oh, that's very interesting to me because um, one is when I first, I first met Jesse Chun, mm -hmm. who does work specifically about how people misinterpret each other uh, as a topic of art. And I thought, you know, I thought that's a great idea mm -hmm. just as a launch pad. Um, and I related to it because my terrible Chinese means I sit through many dinners where I think that people are talking about the latest movies and it turns out they're talking about a trip to the beach, you know, so like where I catch a quarter of the conversation, but it's very entertaining to me nonetheless. Uh, but also this issue of like, um, I guess Asian American was a term that really conjured up a specific stereotype of what the art would look like. And even the term, a bridge between East and West, makes me think there's gonna be calligraphy or dragons involved. And um, that's so, like representation. that's what you're talking about. With, is that what you're talking about with representation? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, so we, as uh, our experience is uh, constantly uh, accompanied this idea of like racial representation, you know, so uh, how do you look? And um, um, 21st century is kind of like the century of uh, uh, a fetish of other. <laughs> but uh, actually, uh, how do we look at ourselves is a just different question, you know, um, and remaining a stran st stranger, but at the same time, you know, building new kind of connectivities with different entities, you know, is definitely important. I kind of want to mention one more thing real quick, though, about misunderstanding is actually the idea of text uh, and uh, in relation to these objects, which is this term I found very, very intriguing. Uh, called a uh, semantic satiation, 
So it's like a phenomenon when you look at something for a prolonged period of time. You know, when you're stuck in somewhere and you read the same text again and again, and maybe you look at this Kinder chocolate again and again, and it becomes uh, something else. You know, it becomes maybe you can't recognize it anymore. <laughs> Is that a misunderstanding or, uh, um, you know, it becomes something totally new? Uh, and that was really like the pivotal moment I was able to actually start, to start, start morphing these objects and, you know, uh, for like new content. Yeah. Okay. And um, how do either of you relate to what Frank's talking about here in terms of identity and what, uh, well, identity? Um, Maybe I'm not being articulate enough, but I'm, I'm just really interested in other people's point of view of what Frank is talking about right now. Um, I came from Shanghai, just as um, Frank, so like naturally we both speak Shanghai dialect as our mother tongue. So Mandarin is already, you know, the first foreign language, and then English, and then a few digital works is another language. Um, so for me personally, it's more like through Frank's work, I am also experiencing this sort of um, travel, like the journey, like um, from the place where we started, and then to the stranger and you know, the the grander space. You know. I I sort of see the work as um, kind of emphasizing what Frank said in terms of like the words becoming something else, um, especially because so much of the work sort of involves both absurdity and frustration. Like there's a, a little bit of a play between the two, like you can get a sense of that. And so I think it's supposed to be really playful and misinterpretations, if that's what they are, are intentional and part of the fun a little bit. Um, and whatever else you get from that experience is, is also meaningful. I think that kind of remainder or whatever is, is part of the work as well. So, specific to this, let's talk about toilet paper and the poetry on the toilet paper. What, what made you think of that? I was waiting for this moment. <laughs> um, so, the toilet paper is, um, um, if you uh, haven't got a chance to go to the deep side of the gallery, there are two rows of toilet paper, and they were like a really kind of like a last minute, very intuitive decision, you know, because I remember I was discussing that with Rachel, how we should show these, um, um, you know, poems. Um, do we like print them out and let the viewers take away? Or, uh, you know, do we just print things on the wall, you know? And eventually uh, something just hit me. There's a voice on the back, you know, of my mind. Let, why don't we use toilet paper? Let's just uh, make it almostly uh, uh, int intimate. Um, and Chen Fan probably, you know, we talked about this idea of writers when they write, uh, and uh, there's like uh, this thing called writing in the uh, drawer, drawer, the drawer literature. It's about like, you know, when writers, they write something and they never get published, or they haven't been published, you know, but the writers keep them to themselves in the most intimate way, uh, in the most honest way. Does that mean these writers, these writings that are not published, are they bad? No, but you know, they're probably, in a way, even better. Uh, so, well, first of all, that was kind of like the way I look at my writing. You know, I don't really think I'm a really good poet. I don't even read that much poems, <laughs> I confess. Um, so that, you know, that, that also contributed to the decision making of printing them on the toilet paper, so just to show them in the most intimate way. And that's why they're also hung like on a lower than eye level on purpose, because, well, technically, you see toilet paper, you are sitting on a toilet. Um, so that's kind of like the eye level <laughs> when you're sitting down. Um, yeah, that's, that's really what I was, in the most honest way, that's what I was thinking, actually. I, I just want to add one more thing, because I want to discuss more about the poetry element, but um, for the <laughs> um, literature in the drawer, or desk drawer literature, I think, um, they are also called sometimes as um, invisible writing. Um, they are forced to be invisible, not because they're not good enough, but actually they're the results um, coming from like the deep down of a writer's heart. And then maybe they want to keep it safe because they're telling the most true things and emotions, right? 
So I had a different interpretation of the poetry on the toilet paper rolls because I know your experience, you were in Berlin at the time, but in the US there was like massive hoarding going on of toilet paper. And so there were shortages and people were buying, you know, large amounts of toilet paper if they could. And anyway, there was price gouging. And so there was this whole other kind of connection to the toilet paper that I was thinking about during the pandemic. Um, but yes, this like intimate space, I think is still the, the, the part of it that is communicated. Yeah, and not to make it too Chinese, I saw it as like a combination of a reference to Duchamp and also that on Chinese scroll paintings, there often are text go calligraphy going down the side with a poem. So I thought this is the way of you adding poetry to your installation. And again, all of these may be misinterpretations, but they're all interesting takes on yeah. the work. Yeah, that is a misunderstanding. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I wasn't thinking about, oh. Honestly, I wasn't thinking about that. Also, what you were saying, you know, what Natasha was saying about the, you know, the crisis of toilet paper. But now you guys are making me thinking about the toilet paper is really becoming a part of the collection of these objects, you know. Maybe one day they will start melting or inflated or deflated again, too. Yeah, in the Chinese scroll painting part. You know, it's probably there subconsciously, I don't know, but yeah. That's very interesting. I don't know. It's... <laughs> My, my, what, what goes on between my ears is often what keeps me interested in art, even if it's completely incorrect. Um, I wanted to ask all of you now, I'm sure there's aspects of this work that I'm not talking about at all that interests both of you. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to, to, for us to hear about your encounter with the work and your interpretation of the work. Do you want to start, Natasha? Whoever wants to start. Okay. <laughs> I want to talk about the poetry um, in Frank's work, because um, they're perhaps not immediately apparent in your works, especially compared with these um, very vibrant um, digital imageries. They have rich colors, they have whimsical characters, and they have fantasy settings. All are very loud and you know speak up w with a high volume. Um, but I think poetry definitely occupies a very unique position in your work. And I noticed that you often put poems um, before other elements like 3D animation in the description line for your artworks. Um, and um, I feel there are like at least three aspects to talk about and to understand um, the poetry in your work. Um, I want to be clear and concise, so I prepared some writing, so <laughs> please bear with me. Okay, um, to begin with, I think it is important for us to comprehend Frank's poetry as rooted in his Chinese cultural background, despite primarily um, being composed in English. Um, as Adorno famously stated, after Auschwitz, poetry becomes unlikely or impossible. Um, he highlighted the poetry's incapacity when faced with severe external stimuli, like pandemics, political turmoil, and social revolutions. However, Professor David Wang, Wang Dewey um, from Harvard, and I know you are a big fan of um, Wang's scholarship, um, so Professor Wang uncovered a counterpoint in Huang Zhongxi, a historian and poet from the Ming Dynasty. Huang Zhongxi advocated for poetry and history to complement each other. He stated that uh, meaning using poetry to fill historical gaps and the shi wang er hou shi zuo. When history dies or collapses, poetry arises. Um, so this view emphasizes the potency of poem writing as a powerful confrontational response to external challenges. And then secondly, the context of such confrontational poem writing, um, just like what you did um, during your lockdown in Berlin, um, I think it aligns with the Chinese literary tradition known as Shu Qing Shi, um, lyrical poems. Again, according to Professor Wang, this English term lyrical is inadequate in translation. 
Unlike Western lyricism, Chinese Xu Tingshi regards emotional expression more as a factual and a declarative element. Um, the term Shu originates from an ancient weaving tool. It's just a little piece of wood um, where you wrap around um, a yarn to like introduce the, um, the threads. So thus, um, Shu is not merely about getting feelings out of your chest. It's a very mechanical and logical process of weaving one's thoughts. Similarly, Qing, beyond its association with Ai Qing, love, and Gan Qing, emotion or affection, it is also Shi Qing, fact, and Qing Kuang, situation. Shu Qing Shi therefore extends beyond the Romanticism, serving as a vessel for preserving personal emotions amid historical fluctuations. And a few Frank's poems underline such function as witness and documentation, encompassing both individual but also collective narratives. Um, thirdly, in Frank's works, the poems are not limited to their contents or textual essence. Instead, they become self-referential signifiers of the act and gesture of poem writing, because Frank not only visualizes but also materializes the intangible quality of poetry. He is stating the existence of poetry, as evident in the, um, in the puffy characters in your videos, and then the toilet paper we just mentioned, and the drapery of the fabrics suspending upon us. Um, I think he handles the textual essence of poetry in the same way as how you render the everyday object in the video, like the cell phone, like the espresso pot. Additionally, in line with your concept, his line, um, in line with his concept of the in-betweenness, nomadism, and migration, Frank evokes the image and metaphor of the poet in exile, who are often forced to abandon and be abandoned by their native tongues, and embody the paradox of being a tourist in one's homeland and an outsider in one's adopted land. I borrowed this tourist and outsider um, description from one of your previous interviews. Um, just as my favorite Chinese poet Zhang Zao once stated, poets should be stuttering questioners. Searching for the mother tongue within the mother tongue. And in Frank's works, I think he explores whether we can find such true poetic mother tongue within foreign languages, within digital creations, in humor, and under otherworldly and unstable circumstances. Thank you, that was beautiful and so enlightening. All right. I did not prepare a whole, um, I apologize, but um, actually I, I was also thinking about one of the things that stood out. Um, I was thinking about how Frank uses poetry not in terms of um, the history of poetry or even thinking about language so much as the way that he animated these characters. So I was thinking about character in two ways. He talked about you know, turning objects into characters, so they have personalities and whatnot, but then also using letters in this way. So literally, the character becomes a character with a personality. So for me, one of the things that really stands out or that struck me about this work is the use of different technologies, different techniques, um, to play with this idea of you know inflating, deflating, but also to play with this idea of the in-betweenness of space, um, which is how we can think of our own lives, how we can think about our homes, how we can think about the internet. Like there's so many different ways to think about that, and I think they're all relevant in this work. Um, but most importantly, there's humor, there's this kind of absurdity, but also a kind of seriousness, um, you know, thinking about our everyday objects and our reliance on them or the ways that we find comfort in, you know, an espresso maker or something like this or chocolate. Um, and so thinking about how all these objects um, kind of come together, especially with respect to this kind of nomadic lifestyle, which I think, you know, if we, if we think about this word immigrant versus the nomad, 
um, there is this linear relationship that Frank talked about that I think is a, a huge difference, um, but also this notion of having a choice of how you want to identify um, and choosing not to identify if that's the way, right? This kind of choice to not align with any one system. And so I think the work reflects this kind of like decision to not commit to one thing, this decision to not give any letter one fixed meaning, any word a fixed meaning, but also objects that have a function that become something else entirely. Um, the phone, for example, that no longer looks like a phone um, and that becomes this kind of cute thing is just like the way that I think humor really helps serve this work to bring about this idea of in-betweenness and its fullness. Yeah, and definitely I think what both of you are talking about is very intriguing ways to enter the work and think about the work. On, um, I want to ask you a funny question. Where did you get the rug from? The rug? Amazon. Okay. <laughs> okay. Often, I've often worked with installation artists who use this kind of rug, and it's, I think it almost embodies the situation we're all in right now, which is we get an ersatz Asian element that we ordered from a global multinational corporation that was probably made in China, very likely. Um, like all of IKEA is made in China, you know, like the Swedish look alike and it's like this kind of mixture of cultures and globalization that we all live with and are accepting of but in art people tend to think that means it's not authentic you are representing a new kind of authenticity do you think so um that's uh that's a big compliment i think and also after all the you know you, you guys talked about these wonderful things i feel like whatever i said next will be very mediocre <laughs> um i want to respond to what you have all just mentioned you know about this lyrical tradition for example uh and if you really think about this lyrical tradition um in china especially it was really proliferated this neo lyrical tradition really got proliferated uh, in the new culture movement, you know, to the uh, communism era, you know, so there is a huge shift of the political spectrums in a country, you know, and it's not just about romantic or, you know, uh, in, in, in a way, but actually there were a lot of struggles too. Uh, and uh, that really echoes the experience, uh, at least I had uh, in the, you know, uh, that year. Uh, so I wanted to like, you know, put that in the work too, you know. Um, so, but at the same time, if you put these words on the paper, you type them out on a screen, you know, same as these objects, they really become finite, you know. So I feel like my task became, you know, how we can transform, how I could transform this, you know, fi these finite texts and objects to something that's rather uh, unimagined. Um, you know, at first it was a challenge, you know, but it was a very interesting challenge, I think. And also in response to what Natasha said about technology, you know, uh, you guys definitely remember in 2020, the pandemic was not the only thing that happened. You know, it was a sequence of uh, social events on a, a large, you know, very in a large scale, right? So there was a pandemic and then there was the consequential uh, whistleblower incidents in China during the lockdown. Uh, there were uh, racial unrest, uh, you know, and protests that quickly um, spread through the whole world. And when I was stuck in Berlin, you know, I received all these informations through the internet. Uh, and uh, that was a strong moment, made me feel like, you know, actually internet became, you know, this technology was uh, uh, becoming this, uh, it was becoming this network that could actually, when the informations were transmitted, eventually how it became bodily, you know, it was very affective, you know, we, um, I strongly felt what George Floyd was, feel, was you know, his, his feeling at the time. Uh, and if you look at these poems, actually, uh, some of these stories and these experiences and these news were actually uh, kind of, you know, embedded in these poems, in each object. Uh, there is like a goggles nose. Um, there is a Kafka's Audra deck. Um, you know, so I was trying to, like, you know, make these stories um, get into the, you know, the content of the work. Um, what was the last question? Sorry. 
Oh yeah. <laughs> yes. Again, the rug. Uh, the, the rug just echoes uh, what I said about you know transforming this finite object to something rather in, unimagined. You know, uh, in, not not just the rug. Actually, all the furnitures you saw here, they are directly from my live and live workspace in Harlem. You know, we just shipped them here, and I made some of the furnitures. You know, to uh, put them together and made this installation. Yeah. Um, is it okay if I open it up? I mean, you've all given us so much to think about, but I want to hear if there's questions from the audience. So, okay, um, thank you all so much. And I, before I start um, passing the mic around, if anyone has questions or wants to think about them, um, I just had a couple comments myself, um, especially. Um, I hear all of you talking so much about this idea of, you know the foreigner, the immigrant, um, et cetera. And it kind of, it has been making me think of um, this text by Julia Kristeva called Strangers to Ourselves. And it's, you know, where, wherein someone who is from somewhere else immigrates to another place and then loses the sense of belonging anywhere. So there's like this kind of detachment. Um, and, you know, through that whole text, she goes through kind of like the history of the idea of like where the stranger as a concept comes from. And so that felt very like resonant with the work. Um, and also um, Natasha to kind of build off of a few things that you were saying, um, thinking about the, the in-betweenness of the objects and having that be kind of a virtual experience, kind of where the virtual aspects and the physical aspects of the work kind of combine um, was also something extremely palpable. Um, and I also just want to say um, I'm so grateful for all of you to be here to lend all of your thoughts and questions to this work um, because it's been making me think about a lot of things that I, um, even having been seeing this work evolve as an installation for the past year, is that I'm seeing for the first time. Um, so I don't know if anyone wants to respond to that or if anyone has any um, comments or questions from the audience to build off of that. I don't know if I can, it, is this okay? Yeah. yeah. So uh, I thank you very much, everyone, on this rainy day, too. Sorry, Barbara? Oh, okay. So I wanted to ask um, Anne about, you know, you have this um, dictionary language, you know, in d abstraction, you know, with design and your, like, stage sets for these objects like Frank does, almost the same back here, you know, in totally different way visually, but the furniture and the, the TV screen for the phone. So I, I was just wondering if you want those small objects to be, like Frank, this storytelling, like persona, because they're so human, I, I you know. I think I'm not in. <laughs> Are you referring to this artist's work, and Wu's, right? Um, unfortunately, I'm not her. I hope I am her. I really admire her <laughs> I'm works. I'm sorry, I didn't know. No, no, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was the question again? The, the, small, the small objects. Does, oh. do, does anyone know? Thank you. Um, I can speak. Oh, yeah, no, I can speak. Sadly, Anne couldn't join us today. Um, but, uh, oh, no, it's okay. Um, so the, um, the small... Yeah, the small objects are, are, I know for a fact that they are a big part of her work. Um, and a lot of these objects, you know, similarly, this installation that we're sitting in, inside of, um, you know, has a lot to do with the very exterior architecture. Um, a lot of these, um, uh, a lot of these sculptures come, they directly reference um, Anne's neighborhood um, where she grew up in Flushing, Queens. And the objects are kind of these small things that she has been collecting around that neighborhood as well. And they're cast objects. So they're, the way that she talks about them is to kind of like, um, there's a way instead of like representing a place through its identity, um, it's kind of like pointing to it. And so, you know, kind of like illuminating what it feels like to be a part of a geographic location without having to necessarily like, you know, represent it or categorize it in any sort of way. But yeah. Yeah. Anyway, thank you for the question. <laughs> um, I wish I'm N2, you know, something <laughs> as good as her. 
Um, so one of the main things that really jumped out at me was the interpretations, the multiple interpretations that could be ha that could be thought of when looking at this exhibition. Um, I think one of the main things that jumped out at me was this like the whole in-betweenness of space. And um, when I see people like coming into the gallery and looking at this exhibition, it kind of creates like a snowball, like snow globe effect of like people walking around and like looking at it from all different angles. How do you like feel that this, like your work in this space like correlates to like your themes and like your inspiration behind it? Uh, so I'm trying to understand. Sorry, everyone. I read now. You you started talking. I really understand how you couldn't. Uh, you probably couldn't hear us well. <laughs> I'm it's a, sorry. It's a, sorry it's about that. It's a very that. loud space. Um, I think Jasmine was asking um, how the um, how you were kind of conceiving of this uh, installation in this space itself. Um, she mentioned this idea of like a snow globe and watching people walk around it. So. Maybe if you could talk a little bit more about how you conceived of the space itself, of the installation. Yeah. I was definitely hoping people will actually transgress and you know, like maybe walk in between these furnitures, you know, and even touch the cloth with their head. You know, I was okay, totally okay with it. You know, but uh, I also understand my uh, just an observation. I still feel like you know people can be actually intimidated by an installation that you know they don't always willing to walk in. You know. Uh, and uh, in the corner over there, there is this pile of uh, installations, small 3D printed resin sculptures, uh, referencing that melted Kinder chocolate. And there are like about 200 of them. So that sums up like seven months. Uh, and it's, to me, it's like a repetition of difference, right? You know, each of them have slightly different color and size. Um, and, uh, you know, something on my mind was like, yeah, maybe people will start taking them away. <laughs> and just, you know, put them in their pocket and walk away. But uh, that actually haven't happened at all. And I was a little bit surprised, you know. But it's always interesting to see how different audience interact in, uh, uh, with different space, you know. That's really like an interesting observation for any artist, I feel. Um, I just wanted to also add something to that of, you know, from the perspective of kind of planning for the installation. Um, and so in, the other times and other iterations of this work that you've displayed it, it's been much more kind of, um, I'm gonna use this word, it's not like a, you know, don't take it too, too hard, but um, it's been like a colder installation where it's just been like monitors and, you know, kind of um, the images in a much more, you know, in a language that's much more related to the display of contemporary art. And in this, um, you were really discussing kind of like really trying to create like a stage for the, um, you know, for this like domestic setting and having the domestic setting being the stage that was on display. I think at one point we were even discussing like creating like a literal stage for the rug to be on on a platform, which I thought we didn't really need, but um, <laughs> so we decided against it. But um, anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there as well, just to talk a little bit more about the, the physicality of it. So yeah. Anybody um, else? Any other questions? Um, well, thank you all for coming um, to this event, and thank you again, everyone, for your lending your thoughts and words to this exhibition, um, to Frank's show. Um, we're so thrilled to have you. Um, and I also wanted to mention, um, these two exhibitions are on view through um, January 28th. Um, so, you know, please come back, see Anne's show when we don't have chairs set up in the middle of it. Um, and yeah, thank you all again.